Dave, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Thanks very much for having me. So to get started, I thought I would ask you about what emergency management and its role is in all emergencies more generally and then specifically in the COVID-19 pandemic. Absolutely. So emergency management exists in every province and in our federal order of government and in most municipalities in the municipal order of government. And so what it is, is it's an organization that looks across all of the sectors that make up our economy, as well as links all orders of governments together. So it's looking at the private sector and the public sector, but it's a government agency that constantly monitors for hazards. And when a hazard hits more than one sector or more than one municipality, the provincial order of government then links together all of the appropriate agencies and responds to a hazard. So let's use a wildfire for an example. They happen in most of our provinces. The wildfire agency that fights the fires, the Wildfire Operations Center, looks after the fire and they try and ensure that the fire is turned away from property and from people. They try and put the fire out. They try and do everything they can to mitigate the fire's effects. But behind them is the emergency management agencies that actually working with the municipalities, it's working with private sector businesses that might be in front of the fire, it's working with everyone and reporting to the Premier on a regular basis, making sure everybody is coordinated and working together. Same thing happens in a flood, the same thing happens in any type of emergency, but for some reason in this pandemic, we decided that we wouldn't use our emergency management agency, we would use health. And so I think that was the very first thing that we did wrong. The second thing is what an emergency management agency does is it's always looking for hazards. And when it sees a hazard, it tries to determine immediately who is most at risk. This was very clear back in January, February, and March. We saw the data coming out of Asia and the data coming out of Europe. And it was very clear that it was people over the age of 60 with multiple comorbidities. And by a comorbidity, I don't mean something that's treated and managed. I mean something that was, if not every day monitored and cared for, was probably gonna cause the individuals to die. And what we were seeing was these people had multiple comorbidities, three or more. And so these people are what many countries call frail. But we saw that over the age of 60, multiple comorbidities were the people most at risk from this COVID-19. If we had immediately, back in February and early March, looked at our long-term care homes where our concentrations of our most frail, our people over 60 with multiple comorbidities, I believe we could have saved up to 15,000 out of the 22,000 deaths we've seen so far. Because 73% of all deaths in Canada have been in long-term care homes. The Emergency Management Agency would have looked immediately at who is most at risk. And in fact, back in March, I did this same sort of analysis with friends and with my son, knowing right away that that's what was about to be announced and it never happened. So an emergency management agency has a far more holistic point of view at what's happening, looks at all of your critical infrastructure, not just hospitals, and tries to pull the whole thing together. We've also had plans in the past from every provincial government on how to deal with pandemics, but we threw them all away at the beginning of this pandemic. And we also decided to put um, health professionals in charge of managing this pandemic rather than emergency management professionals. Why do you think that was? So let's start with the plans because the plans are really important. Every province in Canada had a pandemic plan. They had spent years perfecting them because you review your plans every 10 years. That's part of the emergency management's role is to make sure every plan is brought forward no matter whether fire, flood, tornado, terrorism, you bring it forward, you refresh it every 10 years. So the plans that we had across our country were based on all the lessons learned, the things that we had learned from past pandemics. There's been four previous pandemics in my lifetime and I'm sure there'll be four more in, in your lifetime. One of the things that we always do is we take the hard, hard lessons learned and we put them in our plans. Now, one of the pieces of all of our pandemic plans what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs. Who had just updated that document? It was updated from 10 years before, and it considered all 15 of the things you could do in a pandemic to try and mitigate the spread and to try and care for people that were most at risk. 
Now, in those 15 NPIs, it was very clear that there were a few that were appropriate for this pandemic, but there was also a vast majority that were not appropriate to this pandemic, and in most of our pandemic plans had been excluded because they were only for extremely severe pandemics. So those plans were written, and what should have happened back in February, each of the EMOs should have been tasked to come forward with the subject matter agency, which was health, review the plan, take that plan and make it specific for COVID-19 and issue it to the public. So the public knew exactly what the government was going to do, what were the phases and what was going to happen, who was in charge and what would be each of the steps as it unrolled for both the private sector, the public sector and everyone in the province. That's never happened, not in one of our provinces. So that, that's the plans portion. The shift then to put the medical officers of the health, you saw that tumble across our country. And that was the premier's fault. Each of those premiers should never have done that. They knew they had an emergency management agency who was always there and who should have been the people they came together with. So the first challenge was governance. The premier should have formed a task force on the pandemic made up of the 10, 10 or 11 most impacted ministries within the, their government. Instead, they set up a health advisory board. Wrong thing to do. It should have been all the government ministries that were required with emergency management running the, 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 the collaboration process across all those experts. But who else should have been brought into the room? Designation, designated people out of the municipal orders of government. Here in Alberta, we have what we call the rural association and the, and the urban associations. I'm sure there's a structure like that in every province. You bring one rep from the large communities and the small communities. You get their input in that task force. You also bring in the critical infrastructure, the owners of the biggest things that are going to affect you. Things like your power grid, your, your, your petroleum sector for things like natural gas. All of the people that you think are going to be critical in the pandemic including your food supply. Those people are part of that governance leadership model and then you get all the input from across all of those sectors into the room. Instead, what the premiers did is turn to their medical officer of health. Now, medical officers of health are great at health. That's their wheelhouse. And they should have been part of that task force, but they shouldn't have led that task force and they shouldn't have been the only person in charge of that task force because what you then get is a health focused only response. And you end up with things like, we must ensure our medical system is sustained while everything else around them crumbles. And so I guess I will first go into the pre-pandemic plans. I got a chance to look through the, the World Health Organization pandemic preparedness plan that you had sent me earlier. I looked through it. And one thing that I noticed about it was that it relied mostly on modeling studies to figure out whether uh, NPIs work or not, like face masks and hand washing. And, and they didn't consider lockdowns, but they did consider quarantining healthy individuals. And I have become skeptical of modeling because of how sensitive they are to the initial variables that you plug into them. Like if you look at Ontario's modeling um, for the government, they have been projecting astronomical rises in case numbers because of these new variants that are coming out. And so I have a hard time um, figuring out which information is reliable and which information is not when deciding what the government is doing is right or not. And it seems like an emergency management approach to pandemics and other emergencies is able to cut through that because you focus on, on the data but the, only those who are most at risk of the hazard. Have you gotten any pushback from people who have pointed out that lockdowns work by citing uh, a bunch of studies uh, and modeling exercises? So, so there's, a, there's a whole bunch of pieces to the question you've just asked me. So let's start with modeling. The NPIs, if you look at them, uh, actually I want to start slightly back a little further. The word lockdown is a brand new term. It's a term that has been applied to this pandemic and, and applied to this pandemic in a very unusual way because in fact what they mean by lockdown is there are 15 NPIs. They used 15 out of 15. No one ever thought that would happen. 
That's why they were written separately, not as one word, but as 15 separate words. Let's use the example of, of uh, quarantining of people who have been exposed. We'll start with that one. So it says right in the document, not to be used in any pandemic, period. If you look at the covering on the, on the NPI document, at the bottom, there are a whole series that are simply listed as not recommended under any circumstances. One of them is contact tracing and quarantining of exposed individuals. Why were they not recommended? Because study after study, pandemic after pandemic, had proved that the quarantining of people who had been exposed did not in any way stop the spread of the disease. What it did do is cause massive collateral damage. So you don't take healthy individuals and send them home. And we used 15 out of 15. The one on school said only use in extreme severe pandemics as a last case, a last chance. For our children, we know and we knew before that children weren't at risk. So it's not, a severe, not even a severe pandemic for children. If at best it's a moderate pandemic, so we should never have considered school closures. The one for workplace uh, closures says exactly the same thing, only in extreme cases. So back in the middle of March, we took 15 out of 15 NPIs and we used them all as our first case model. That's what happens, unfortunately, because the medical officers of health were put in charge. They should have known that document. They should have known it inside out. And I can't understand why they would use 15 out of 15 all at once when some are specifically said not effective in controlling the spread, but cause significant collateral damage. Let's move to your second part of your question, which is modeling. I, like you, believe modeling has completely failed and has been used as a weapon of fear. It hasn't been used for what modeling is really for, but let's start to deal with the London College model. We've known that since mad cow disease, that model doesn't work. And yet it was the first model of choice all over the world. I don't understand. It had failed four times in four previous uh, disease outbreaks, and every time was producing estimates of numbers 12 times or more than ever occurred. So it was a flawed modeling tool. But what do you use modeling for? An emergency management agency uses models to try and determine how many people would be sick and therefore not able to come to work. It doesn't use it to try and scare the population, but let's use critical infrastructure. Let's use your power grid. Let's say within your power grid, you have all the generators, then you have transmission, and then you have all of your distribution where it goes into all your homes. Through that grid, there's normally a couple of spots where that are absolutely critical and there's some really skilled operators that run that power grid. So in a pandemic, what you're worried about is some of those operators that run your power grid, too many of them might get sick and you do quarantine people who are ill. So you send them home. But what happens if you have to send home more than you have available to run the grid? Well, then you have to do what's called surge capacity. So what modeling is used for is to make sure you have surge capacity in all your critical infrastructure, not just hospitals, knowing that people will get sick during the pandemic and making sure you have backup people for them, making sure that you either train them right away, you recall people who have recently retired, you graduate early some people, you look, if, if we hadn't make it, made our provinces so afraid of each other and working as little isolated cells, you might have actually gone to another province and asked them for help in a certain area only if you needed it, right? So, so modeling, yes, I believe it's, it's tremendously failed, but it was wrongly used. It should never have been used as a way of telling the media to tell the public to hide in their homes in lockdowns. We should never have envisioned lockdowns and we shouldn't have used case counts as a way to determine success or failure. Other countries in the world have not used case count and have come through this pandemic far better than us. You mentioned the UC, the University College of London modeling exercise with Neil Ferguson at the at the head of that. Do you have do you know why governments have decided to all rely on that? And do you have proof that they chose to rely on that study? Because I looked into the JCCF's 
study Flying Blind, and they also said that the government relied on it. But I don't see any connection between the government's policies and the modeling. I don't think modeling was ever intended to be used in the way it was, and that's why you probably won't even find it in the plans. I'm not a modeling expert. I would ask that you get some of the people that have done some really lengthy pieces on that. But what I've seen from evidence, and as you say, as an emergency manager, I use evidence. I use data. I, I, I don't go for, uh, for different theories and different models. What I've seen is articles written around the world. I've seen articles out of Germany, out of Australia, out of, uh, out of Sweden, out of uh, Great Britain, all of which showed that, especially in the first wave, these models were used. And, and you can remember the about turn that the Prime Minister of Great Britain did. He was trying to stay open. He was trying not to use the lockdown, i.e. all 15 out of 15 NPIs. And then all of a sudden he switched and he switched after his medical officer of health brought in this massive modeling data saying that they were going to kill hundreds of thousands of people if they didn't lock down. The same thing happened in Germany. I have friends that still live in Germany. I lived there for, for six years and, and we still converse. And the same thing happened there. These models suddenly sprung up in the middle of March. They weren't part of original pandemic plans and the way that models were used in pandemic plans was to ensure critical infrastructure and to build surge capacity for your critical infrastructure in your hospitals, not as a tool for monitoring how successful you were. So uh, again, I'm not a modeling expert, but certainly you and I have seen the same articles worldwide that say models were used as a terror weapon, not as a surge capacity weapon. Okay. Um, have you been in touch with your successor of emergency management in Alberta? And did he or see what is his or her thoughts on the way that this pandemic has So there's been unfolded. a number of successors. I, I retired in uh, 2005, and in fact, here in my province, the chap who was taken over was only just recently appointed, sort of in the middle of the pandemic. And I would not, uh, I would not put them in the position of being fired. So I have not talked to them. Uh, if I had and it had been found out, they may well have been let go. I have been told by doctors and by emergency managers uh, that, that if people find out they're talking to me, their jobs are at risk. So no, I haven't spoken with him and uh, no, I haven't spoken with, with other people uh, in that area across the country for the simple fact that they, there is a move to ensure that only the current government direction is in place and people who speak out of line have had their careers threatened. That was something that I have found pretty worrisome because for my position as a citizen, I trust debates. I see there are different views on a certain subject. I see that some that, that some views are viewed by both debaters as wrong or weird. I see that others there's disagreement about. But when I see that there's a clamping down of debate, I immediately distrust whatever it is that is being put forward as the, the narrative that is correct. And that is something that I've seen with doctors as well. Uh, Dr. Matt Strauss, he was a former guest on this podcast, and he was one of the signers of the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, and his his boss at, at Queen's University Medicine, he wrote an article criticizing the writers of the Great Barrington Declaration for bringing in discord into our public discourse. And that was something I wanted to ask you about. There is this there's this tension between having a trans having a public plan which is transparent and and debate which is transparent between doctors and nurses in the medical community versus having a strict control of the narrative and and orders and what is to be expected and to be charitable to the second group i would say that you know if there is coherence between between medical professionals then this means that they know what they're doing and that the public can rely on them and if there isn't then that threatens the integrity of the medical system and their authority so which one do you think would be better for um, more public buy-in and more, more public trust clearly i believe that i've been uh, i've been writing to the premiers since april may to all of them my own premier since April. So I've written over 11 letters 
all with different tax, different methodologies. At the same time, starting in May, I've sent them to the media, all the mainstream media and, and the independent media. No one would publish, no one would talk to me. I know they were received, I got the receipts, but, but because no dissent was allowed. And it scares the hell out of me when in the largest public emergency in the last four, well, in the last decade, that any discussion even behind the scenes was not permitted for the first seven months i was desperately trying just to talk to the premiers and their key staff i was trying to ensure confidence in government i wasn't trying to bring the government down i was trying to say there's a better way when all debate and all discussion was cancelled by the medical officers of health because they were in charge and would not listen to another point of view then in November, I tried to start using other paths, and I finally was published by C2C Journal with an alternate path. And since then, I've only been covered in by the independent media with two exceptions. And it, it's so concerning that we are doing such massive damage to our society. And by massive damage, I mean NPIs cause massive mental health issues, societal health issues, the destruction of the edu two years of education of our children, but even more important than the academic education, their socialization. In, in elementary school, junior high and senior high, so many things that, that are so important for later in life are now, now replaced by fear. People who have severe other illnesses, not COVID, heart attack, diabetes, uh, cancer, are being pushed back and we're seeing articles now just another one today how long the, the wait times are going to be now and how many people have delayed so badly that they've died at home instead of going to a hospital for fear of covid and the last piece of the big five is our economy and people say oh you, you only you, you're, you're putting dollars ahead of lives well i'm exactly the opposite guy I'm the guy that wanted to save our seniors over 60 with multiple comorbidities by doing a proper quarantining system within long-term care homes for the staff as well as the residents in a humane and fun way while it was completely ignored by others. But if we don't think that doubling our national debt in a year is not going to have huge repercussions on our medical system, our mental health system, our society and all those other social programs that we, we want in our country, then, then we're living in a dream world. To add over $400 billion in a federal debt and the equivalent with every province in our country, this is going to last at least a decade, if not a generation to fix. And so I, I can't understand why no discussion, because when you do try and start a discussion, they, they immediately flick to if you break solidarity with the government and, and we don't follow case counts, you're going to kill people. Well, I'm afraid you're the ones who are killing people by ignoring the collateral damage and by ignoring our seniors and focusing on case count. And I want to go back to the case count in a little more detail. We knew from the studies 2019 on NPIs that almost all of those NPIs did not in any way significantly change case count. They, they call it in the thing uh, uh, significantly reducing the spread of the virus. It doesn't. And so that's why they weren't recommended knowing they did the collateral damage. Things like closing business. Things like closing schools. Things like isolating people uh, who have been exposed. Even things like closing of our airports. It says right in there, don't do this. After the first two weeks, it's not effective, and yet it will have huge collateral damage. Don't do it, okay? So, and the whole idea that people think that we've closed our airports, so we've stopped all foreign travel, 30,000 trucks a day in the pandemic, not before, it was way more before, 30,000 trucks a day go back and forth across the Canadian border. They're bringing our food and our medicine and our critical equipment. So if we think we've closed the border, we've closed 6% of travel into our country. The other 94% continues every day and has every day. So people that think we can isolate Canada, it won't happen. But that whole idea that, that if you are locking down, you're stopping the spread, we knew it wouldn't work before. 
That was the MPIs. There's been a study released in December by some of the best infectious disease doctors in the world. And what they did is they studied non-lockdown countries and lockdown countries. And the results were very clear. They said there is no significant decrease in spread by doing lockdowns, comparing pure lockdown to non-lockdown countries. So if it's not affecting case count, the entire argument is gone, and yet it's doing massive collateral damage. I want to ask you about how to think more clearly without getting moralistic in a crisis like this, because it sounds like uh, what you're referring to is the same thing which Dr. Ari Joffe referred to in his article about thinking as if we're in a war. Um, anyone who's against that is automatically seen as a threat to the group. Um, before we do that, in the in the World Health Organization document that you were citing, once again, I, I don't fully uh, believe it, so to speak, because of how much uh, they use modeling in it. But they do mention that um, quarantining exposed individuals, which is what we're doing now, 14 days, it, it can work. It says quarantine is generally effective in reducing burden of disease and transmissibility and in delaying the peak of the pandemic. And the, the studies that they cited for that one said that it reduced excess deaths in New York and Denver in 1918, 1919, uh, and along with H1N1 in Beijing. So I think what they were saying instead was that there wasn't enough evidence to show that it worked, not that it didn't work. If that's the case, then we're in a new situation now where we have done things we've never done before. Um, perhaps they do work. So I will immediately give you the, the most obvious evidence as opposed to modeling or, uh, or very small sample case studies. Let's use Sweden, and I can hear everyone screaming already. Sweden strongly discouraged, in fact said, don't wear masks. They believed that one meter social distancing was all that was required and, and they never made it, it was a recommendation, not a requirement. They only closed their senior high schools for two weeks, they never closed any of the rest and they never ordered any of their businesses closed. And through the first wave and through most of the second wave, and we'll talk about the end of the second wave and the politics that came into play, Sweden, in fact, if you compare Sweden with 10 million people to the province of Quebec with 8.5 million people, on a per capita death rate, Sweden and Quebec are tied. And for people under the age of 60, without multiple comorbidities, Sweden has done as well or better than Quebec. So if people believe that lockdowns have saved lives, it hasn't. Sweden's hospital system was never overwhelmed, period. And you can, instead of reading Western media, read the material directly out of Sweden from people like Sebastian Rushworth and Dr. Tegnell. Their hospital system wasn't overwhelmed. And the only reason why they have now pushed for lockdowns is because their prime minister is afraid of using, losing the next election and has seen other governments do better in the polls by using lockdowns. So it's politically motivated, not medically motivated. So if all the social distancing, all the masks, all the, the, the closures of schools, the closures of business are so effective it's a shame that Sweden's done so well to prove that all wrong, okay? It, it, and it's simply not true. And, and there's even a worse case, which is Belarus. The, 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 you don't want to follow what Belarus did because unfortunately the leader of Belarus is, is a despot dictator, but he held COVID parties. He held huge football matches. He encouraged every town and village to have gatherings. They have done exactly the same as their European neighbors instead of deaths. And I want to come back to the fact that separate deaths from collateral damage in case count. Who died in every country in the world? People over 60, multiple comorbidities, severe multiple comorbidities. Here in Canada, the average age of death is 84 years old with three or more comorbidities. That's 96% of the deaths in our country, 96%. That only leaves 4% left. And that 4% are, 
If you want to put things into perspective, if you're between the age of 20 and 40, one full year of COVID, you have a five times greater chance of dying in a car accident than you do from COVID. And yet we don't lock you down and order you to stay in your house to save your life from a car accident. It, it, it right. no, been no perspective offered. Medical officers of health have given us numbers without denominators. At the peak in Ontario, we were told the Ontario hospital system was being, not about to be, being overwhelmed when they had 1,760 patients in acute care beds. What you weren't told was the Ontario medical system has 22,358 acute care beds. So if something was overwhelming the Ontario medical system, it wasn't COVID. 1,760 of 22,358 beds? You're not ever given denominators. You're not given anything in perspective. For people over 70, they have twice as likely a chance of dying of a heart attack as from COVID. Uh, you're never given perspective. Confidence in government is built by a government saying, this disease is coming, it's serious, it's really serious for people over 60 with multiple comorbidities, here's how we're gonna protect them. For the rest of our population, it, it's like a, 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 an influenza season. If you're under 60, it's simply not that deadly. We're gonna carry on and we're gonna make sure we take care of those most at risk while at the same time monitoring the disease and see if there's a change. But folks, look, you, you, you've got a five times greater chance of dying in a car accident. Go to work, feel safe. Got you. Um, so one solution that you've put forward, I'm not sure if you've changed it since then, but it was to quarantine nursing homes and to ask for volunteers for um, the people who work at nursing homes to quarantine with the people that they, they work with. Um, that was something that I found interesting because I, I feel like the expectation would be that no one would ever willingly um, choose to stay away from their families for a long period of time. Um, you would have to either force them to do that or pay them insane amounts of money and that wouldn't work at all. But why do you think that asking for volunteers would work uh, for these long-term care home workers uh, when you have situations in Quebec, for example, where many of them were so afraid that they just left their place of work, leaving many people in uh, nursing homes to simply die or ne be neglected. Because I don't believe the government ever came forward with a plan. The government never included them. Okay, so let's talk about emergency management again. I'm one guy. My expertise is bringing experts together, running a process pulling all the best ideas out of their head, developing options, presenting the options to leadership, in this case, a premier, having the leader pick the option that they want, writing a plan, issuing the plan, and then implementing the plan. So let's talk about that one. The, the one that, that I've, I've used in my discussions was one I came up with my son, who's 41 years old, and we did it in his living room with a friend of mine, early March. We said, okay, it, it's clear if people come into the long-term care homes and these are the people that are most at risk and they come in every day, they're gonna sooner or later bring COVID in and people are gonna to start to die because these are the people with severe multiple comorbidities. So the first thing we did is we said, okay, let's, let's figure this out. We need a shift system. Now here in Alberta, we have people that live in Fort McMurray, but most of the people that work in Fort McMurray come in for 30 days, go home for 30 days, go in for 30 days, go home for 30 days. You could do exactly the same thing. And what I would have done is brought together a team of experts. I would have brought people in from long-term care homes, which are public sector and private sector, both for-profit and not-for-profit. I would have brought in the associations and actual representation out of a large, medium, and small, and I would have brought in the union. I would have had that whole discussion with the medical officer of health, with people from Alberta infrastructure, people from Alberta transportation, all the people I think that would have been needed to make that plan. Because what I was suggesting was we establish government hotels nearby these facilities. We put people into those hotels, we pay their, 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 their food and their lodging, and they live in there for 14 days pre-quarantine. This is assuming we don't have rapid testing. That's a discussion we can have later. So I'm talking first wave now. So you bring them in, 
and you offer them an incentive in pay. Now, we know that a lot of people that work in long-term care homes are really attached to the residents, number one. They really have growing attachments to these people. Number two, many of them are here making additional money. They're part of our foreign worker uh, employment group, and many of them are here trying to make money to send home to, to their, their families back at home. If you offer them this situation, now I'm not saying you'll get them all that way, and there's many other ways to build that surge capacity, but if you offer them the opportunity, include them in the process, ensure they have the correct PPE for themselves, but remember, if the long-term care home is quarantined, the bug's not getting in, they're in a quarantine hotel, the bug's not into them. So you move them on their daily shift, whatever their shift is, you move them in, and you can get, they can work in as many long-term care homes as you want because they're quarantined. They go back. You also put entertainers. You also put people that are going to be providing additional assistance to the seniors with things like uh, communication devices, uh, or using IT to support them to communicate regularly with their families. You build hugging walls right directly in where the family could actually come in one side outside of quarantine to people that are inside quarantine and hug through the plastic arms and all that stuff we saw being done in Europe but we never did here. All right, That's the first wave, right? So you build that plant. They do 14 days, then they do 30 days on or, or, or 40 days on, whatever the, the model is, so that then they can have a whole period off and go back to their families while the second shift comes in. I'm positive you could have found volunteers to do that. But when people say to me, well, that, that's not humane to that staff, instead what we've done is we've told every citizen in our province to lock themselves in their house and not associate with other family members that don't live in their dwelling. We did it to a whole province instead of the people that work in long-term care homes. So if you want to apply the logic that that's inhumane, well, what have we just done to our entire population for a whole year? It, th you've got to use the same logic, only I'm trying to minimize it with people that if I compensate them with pay, I make sure that I take good care of their family while they're away. You, you build a model and you do it with the owner operators, you do it with the unions, you do it with the people that are actually going to work in the situation. Now, that gets you through the first wave. Then we had four months to come up with many, many, many plans, one of which should have been rapid testing so that an individual could have gone home at night, been tested, and known they were good for at least half their shift, retested for their second half, or if you got even a better rapid test, they were good for the whole shift, go home. And when they're sick, you quarantine sick, you don't quarantine healthy, right? It, the whole idea is to minimize the impact on all of your operations. How do you pay for this? Well, we did it by borrowing $400 billion, and we still killed all the people in long-term care homes, 16,000 of them. So, yes, do I think it's possible? Absolutely. I've done things like that before in other situations. And when we worked through counterterrorism, we were constantly worried about losing critical employees at critical times, trying to build surge capacity. And we developed models how you get surge capacity by bringing back people who've been recently retired, by bringing back people who, who chose a different career path and saying, no, you're critical to this mission. We'd like you to come back and work here instead of working over there and we'll make it worth your while. By graduating uh, people that are already in the training programs a little bit early and giving them that on-job training instead of in a university by looking to our neighboring provinces for help. We thought it was inhumane, and we do it to our soldiers all the time. How did we get over it in Quebec? We brought soldiers in and quarantined them, right? And only allowed them camp work, camp work. It, it, you could have done it without the military, and remember, it only worked in Quebec because they took every single person who was medically trained in the entire Canadian forces. There was none left to do it in Alberta, British Columbia, BC. We took the whole and gave them to Quebec because they botched it so bad. You have to do this before that first outbreak. I, I almost cried when I saw that from the middle of March when we declared that state of emergency and locked everybody in our houses, suddenly they're surprised a month later when COVID made its way into a long-term care home. Unconscionable. That's the planning you do in February if you follow a process. And remember, I'm one guy, that's one plan. I'm sure there was probably bright people that could have made seven plans. Nobody even tried. Got you. Um, so before I move on to thinking clearly, I wanted to ask you, uh, people with multiple comorbidities, not all of them live in nursing homes. Maybe 
and, and people who are most at risk of, of COVID-19 are 60 and older who also have multiple comorbidities. Right. Um, that might be, I'm just guessing, 20, 30 percent of our population, uh, 60 and older who have multiple comorbidities. What do you do with them? Because we, I can't say you can't put them in hotels because we can spend um, a lot of money. So what would you say or what did you think of doing with people like that? OK, that same day with my son drinking scotch, I want to take you back to early March. OK, and, and, and I, I'm not trying to be trite, but we did both cases. Long-term care homes, clearly where your concentrations are, but out in the community. So who do you engage to find those people? Answer's pretty, slick, pretty clear, family practitioners. The people, the doctors who actually work with those people all year round, they know where they are, they know who they are, right? They're in their patient list. The medical officer of health should have gone to all the family practitioners province by province and said, Okay, we're looking specifically, we're looking for people with three or more of the following comorbidities. And we knew what they were. We had the data from the world, right, in February, and, and then refined in March, and then refined in April. We knew who they were. So you go to your family practitioner network, the communication systems that are in health, you say, I want three and more. Okay, we're going to start with them three and more, not two or one. And, and, and remember, I'm talking severe comorbidities. These are things that, if not constantly monitored, like each month or less, will lead to death. So the doctors know who they are. The family practitioner doctors know who they are. You get those lists, and then you develop options, again, with that really smart group of people that should have been brought together across all of government, and you can offer several options. Yes, you can actually offer them a quarantine hotel to get through the first wave, and then we'll figure out what to do for the second wave better, right? You can actually do that. You can take over a hotel, put some medical staff in there, but, but set it up there. Or if they want to stay in their home, and, and I want to come back to this charter rights and freedoms things for old people. I want to talk about that later. But, but right now, you go to the, the homes, and one of the things my friend said, okay, you have people that are living in their home, and they have, a, obviously, if they have that severe three comorbidities, they have a family member normally, or already medical staff, that is their main care provider. So you offer them ability to, in their own home, quarantine in home, and people have had to do this on their own because they were neglected by our governments. But you ought to say, as a government, listen, we're going to give you additional support so that your, your elder can stay in their home. And, and here's the types of things we're looking at, and here's some protective equipment, and here's some really good ideas about how to get food delivered and everything else. In fact, we can send up a food distribution system because we own Alberta Transportation, and we also work directly with, with Alberta Agriculture, who can identify the primary food groups, put together packages, and deliver them. All these models. We could have had safe delivery of food, safe delivery of medicine, safe delivery. We could have built a model for that to, to care for these people in their own homes. What we saw instead was people so terrified of what was happening in the long-term care homes, they were taking their parents out into the community and they were dying in the community. Unconscionable, right? So yes, out of the 96% who've died, 73% happened in our long-term care homes. So that means there's another 23% that died in the community because we didn't have a plan. We didn't bring together the best minds. Emergency management is a process that brings the smartest people together and produces concepts and plans that you can adjust because you didn't have one option, you had several options. And if you see what the option you chose not working as well, you've got another option already in the bin because you built many options while you were looking at it the first time. And you can shift seamlessly between it. But let's go back to, to the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I don't believe that even in the long-term care homes, unless the individual cannot choose for themselves, they're so medically compromised, either with dementia, which is one of our hugest problems in the long-term care homes and for COVID, then that if they can't choose for themselves, then I believe the government has an obligation to protect them, period. But if they can choose for themselves, we should have given the option in our long-term care homes for non-quarantine and quarantine in the same facility or move people who chose not to be in quarantine into a, a nearby facility and move all the people who want to quarantine all these different options remember i'm talking about options here because i don't believe i believe that many of our seniors would have chosen to be with their families still with all the medical they needed long-term care support right you can't take that support away i'm saying with the same supports as they had 
Some will choose. I still want my family to visit. It's not worth living without my family. If I can't get my grandkids to hug me every day, it's not worth living, right? And and so I believe we say to people, it's your risk. And we say to all citizens, we never try and take the risk away from people. That's not government's role. The government is to say, here's the risk. Here's your options, right? And so those elders that, that chose to live outside of quarantine should have been freely without any uh, judgment said okay we've got a facility for you and for those no no I'm really afraid of COVID I'll put up a facility for you right and that concept wasn't even discussed it was one shoe fits all and everybody's charter rights in the province is done because you're not allowed to visit anybody who's not even in your own house you know period and, th and we've been doing that for now since November, right? So, so it's unconscionable to me that we wouldn't at least offer options to the seniors and say yes, but protect those who we have an obligation to protect who say no, I'm terrified of COVID and yeah, I'm prepared to, to, to go. But but I, I don't think that's even in the full quarantine setup. I don't know if you read the article that came out of France. In the first wave, there was a group in France and, and the primary caregivers that ran that facility said, we're not killing, these pe we love these people. So one morning, the director of the facility walked in the door and said, nobody's going home. Anybody who wants to go home, you can leave now, no judgment. And the entire staff volunteered to stay. They stayed for 47 days, a month and a half. No one in, no one out. They had food delivered. The very first day they had mattresses delivered. So they, they could all, all the offices were turned into bedrooms for the staff. And at the end of 47 days, they'd lost two people in the long-term care home, both from natural causes. No, COVID never got in because a quarantine's a quarantine and they did it right. But they also brought, through a quarantine system, entertainers, they brought people with, with fun activities, they brought in uh, uh, additional aids, a whole bunch of aids, so that communication could happen with the families. And at the end of 47 days, the, not just the staff were happy because they'd say, but the residents were overjoyed. They, they'd had a really good 47 day experience. Why didn't we do that in Canada? And, and, only, and I don't mean by the staff having to make the decision themselves. I mean by the government helping the staff and, and providing them with additional tools and all of the things instead of trying to lock down our entire country and spending $400 billion we could have spent two billion dollars and handled our long-term care homes and maybe save fifteen thousand Canadians. You said you retired fifteen, sixteen years ago, and this pandemic has pulled you out of retirement, and you're coming onto shows and stuff like that. It must be incredibly frustrating for you to see um, negligence and incompetence at such a high level. It, it, it well. My wife won't let me watch the news anymore because I've almost broken the TV too many times. I, I just find it unbelievable. And I, I find it unbelievable that people disregarded everything we'd learned before. I find it even more unbelievable that people don't look at other examples in the world that are clearly doing better than us. And I don't understand why people say, ignore science, that they're using science when they're ignoring 90% of the science, which clearly shows there was a better way to do this. So am I frustrated? I'm really frustrated, but I know a whole whack of doctors who are in the system who are really, really frustrated, and they're being represented by the five or six that get on television every night saying, if you don't down, lock down longer, harder, and deeper, uh, more people are gonna die, when those doctors know exactly the opposite is happening, that people are dying of mental health, they're dying of overdoses, they're dying of cancer and, and, and uh, uh, diabetes and, and heart attacks because they're too afraid to go to the hospital. Our children are having damage that we won't even recognize for about four to five years. But imagine when these people who are in our schools now, I've got six grandkids. They're all in junior high and senior high, most in senior high. They're gonna run our country in 20 years. What have we taught them? We've taught them that in an emergency, you run and hide. It, it, it's, it's the damage to our society. When, when we see provinces putting up boundaries between barriers, between movement between provinces, this is going to have long-term impacts. The, the, the whole concept, what you do in an emergency, and I've been in some pretty shitty places in my life, 
and I wouldn't have changed anything. I chose my career. I'm not looking for sympathy. I chose my career. But trust me, when you're in the middle of the shittiest day of your life and all the soldiers look at you, what do they want to hear? I think you should go to your quarters and hide. Or, okay, folks, let's go. We've got this covered. We're ready for this. You go over there. We've got a plan. Here's the plan. This is what the options are. And we're going to work our way through this. Okay, you, you, and you, this is your piece of the pie. You were all part of building this plan. Let's go. Right? You, confidence yep. versus fear. I wrote a, a letter to the premiers back in August saying there's two words. The opposite of fear isn't bravery. It's confidence. How do you destroy fear? You destroy it with confidence. You say to people, we've written a plan. Every member, every citizen, here it is. This is what we're going to do. You then say, this is how we're going to care for the most at risk. And here's a dedicated plan. And here's the options we considered. And this is what we're going forward. But if you've got some good input, send it to us. Here's a website where you can send us good ideas. Then we're going to make sure our critical infrastructure is sustained. And we built a plan. And here it is. We're not telling you what the critical infrastructure is. That just means terrorists can blow it up. But we've got it covered, right? Now, here's what we're going to Let's look at this disease. Let's really look at this disease. And let's look at it in two ways. The first way we're going to look at it is let's put it in perspective. If you're under 60, you got a way bigger chance of dying in a car accident than you do from this thing. Don't worry about it. If you're over 60, here's you know, we've already told you the plan for you. But as well, let's let's talk about it in terms of perspective. We built a robust hospital system. This is how many acute care beds we've got. And at worst, we're expecting it to use this many. But we've always we got a plan, even if it gets there. Let's talk I, about I this disease, though, in terms of what can you do as an individual to keep yourself healthy from this disease. Let, let's, and I'm not talking about hand washing and hiding in your house. I'm talking about one of the biggest um, uh, comorbidities in the studies that we've seen is obesity. So what a great time! Let's get healthy. Let's get physically fit. Let's keep our gyms open. Let's eat right. Let's let's give that information to how to manage that, right? What have you been saying to the doctors and and people who are within institutions who see that what's going on in the public eye on media, where doctors are going on and saying that um, the hospitals are overflowing? What have you been? What have the doctors and and nurses who disagree with the mainstream view? What have they been doing um, to push back against this? And what? Or what do you think is the responsible thing to do in a situation like that? Well, I, you've already interviewed Dr. Ari Jaffe. He's one of the bravest men I know because he's literally put his career on the line. Because I know many other doctors who have tried to do what he's done and they have either been threatened or been moved and told that, uh, demoted and told that one more word they're gone. So. It's very hard when you're living in a culture, a cancel culture, where even the public will condemn you if you're a doctor and you speak out against the mainstream doctors. So it, to me, that's very difficult. I've got correspondence from people who work in emergency management. The same things happen to them. I've had teachers come to me. Same things happen to them. You step out of line, you say something different, your career is at jeopardy. So what do I, what do I suggest them to do? Whatever they are comfortable with. Because if they're comfortable pushing back, if they're comfortable having a serious conversation within their establishment, please, please do. But I know so many of them who have tried and who have had their careers threatened, some have simply walked away, right? But, but business, think about businesses. The businesses, we open and close, we open and close, we open and close. If they speak out and say, you know from first wave and first half of second wave, that we weren't the, where this thing was spreading, even if you believe in case count, and I don't. I think that's the most ridiculous measure. But even case count wasn't increasing because of them, and we slammed them shut anyhow. But I want to go back to business just for a sec. We say we've, we've closed business. At the peak of the first wave, CERB accounts, between CERB and wage replacement through employers, we had nine, uh, 8.9 million Canadians removed from the workforce. That's the numbers on CERB and wage, wage replacement. That was just under half the Canadian labor force. About 21 million is our total labor force in Canada. There's only 68 million of us, right? Whole bunch of old people, whole bunch of kids. So we had almost half our workforce sitting on their butts at home on CERB or wage replacement. 
Now we're somewhere around four and a half to five million sitting on those those two categories. Most people are at work. And yet the media would have you believe that if we don't lock down longer, harder and deeper, this thing's going to keep spreading. Well, yeah, because two thirds of the workforce is still going to work every day. And even the ones that aren't are still get, getting their groceries and they're still going here. And I've seen more houses built outside of my window here. The construction industry has never slowed down. We've built more houses this last uh, uh, 12 months than the previous year. That industry doesn't wear masks. They don't social distance. They're building houses as fast as they can. So it, it's only certain industries that we've closed and the government has chosen winners and losers. We should never remove risk from people. People should be told the danger. If you're under 60, it's less than a car accident. We've, we've lost about 790 Canadians under 60. We lose 1,200 every year to car accident under 60. I mean, we're just not putting things in perspective. And, and yes, COVID is really, really bad if you catch it, but you recover, right? And, and I, I understand. We also don't talk about asymptomatic. 80% of the people who catch COVID, 40%, and we know these from studies in Iceland, because Iceland did a huge study on their whole population. 40% are so asymptomatic, they, they didn't just simply didn't know they'd had it. Another 40% had either a sore neck, uh, sore shoulders, uh, some minor cough that lasted a day or two. So 80% of people it's that last 20% that are symptomatic that have that, that we're talking about in case counts. The other 80% aren't counted. So I know with Dr. Joppe, you talked about infection uh, fatality rate versus case fatality rate, right? And and so the right. infection fatality rate for COVID under 60 is the flu, and yet we've never locked our society down for that before. So perspective is so important. I, I, we have only a couple of minutes left, and I Sorry. wanted to ask you two other questions about that, um, about um, something else. We already went through pushback if you are a doctor or a nurse or someone in an institution and your career has been threatened, which is very sad, which is what I try and learn how to manage if, on this podcast. Um, if you are a citizen or a business owner, what do you think about civil disobedience? Uh, there was uh, Adam... Adam something, I forgot his name, in Ontario, he had a barbecue joint. He opened that up Skelly. day after day. Adam Skelly. Adam Skelly. And civil disobedience as a citizen, for me in Quebec, it means um, visiting my friend even though they live, even though we don't live in the same residence. Just a simple act of civil disobedience like that, which I think most people are doing, making the law a joke. Um, what do you think about civil disobedience as a response to this pandemic? Okay, so I got to break this into a couple of pieces. But first of all, uh, my entire aim for the entire time, from the day this started till today and will continue to be, I am trying to change rules that I believe are wrong. I don't, I personally don't do use civil disobedience, and it's not that I don't believe in it, it's that I personally don't do that. That's not my history, that's not my past, that's not who I am. Other people that choose to do it, it's been effective in, in other venues, but I would never encourage it because that's not who I am, okay? That's up to each individual to decide how they wish to do it. But I'll tell you one very short story. When I was a brand new lieutenant, a man who I've respected my whole life ended up retiring as a general. General Jim Hansen said to me, and I quote, David, never make a rule that you don't intend to enforce. It makes every other rule you state from then on liable to suspect. So if the government doesn't intend to follow their own rules, never make them. If the government won't enforce their own rules, don't make them. If you make an unenforceable rule, that's the worst thing you can do because then every other rule is suspect. And how do you how have you responded to pushback that you've gotten for your plans and your opinions? Well, I've been personally attacked. I've had a whole bunch of things said about me. I've had uh, people specifically directed to try and deal with me. I just carry on. Now, the nice thing about being old and being retired is they can't threaten my job, right? Uh, but I know my family is very proud of what I'm trying to do. And by family, I mean my kids and my grandkids. 
I just want Canada to come back to being Canada. I want the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to be upheld. I want uh, our, our country to go back to the country that I put a uniform on to defend for 27 years. And, and I really believe that Canada is different than any other country in the world, and I've seen a bunch of them. And so I, I want to come out the other end of this that way, and I'm prepared to put up with, with the things that are said about me and, and, and the way people deal with me. I'm old and retired. Awesome. And did you have any other last thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience? I, I, just, I just want to go back to the Charter. One of the basic things about the Charter is if you can't demonstrably show why you're going to deny a Charter right, you don't have the right to do it. From the beginning, we knew that lockdowns, i.e. the imposition of 15 out of 15 non-pharmaceuticals, had very slim, if any, effect. We've seen other countries that haven't done things like this. And they look exactly like us in terms of death and in terms of uh, case counts. We've had studies that show case counts directly comparing lockdown, real science, lockdown to non-lockdown. Lockdowns don't work. But what they do do is create massive collateral damage that we're going to pay for the next 20 years. Mental health, societal health, uh, other severe illnesses, the damage to our children's socialization and education, and a crush to our economy with, with massive new debt provincially and federally. So it's time for lockdowns to be ended. We should not use non-pharmaceutical interventions for a pandemic of this severity, which is at most moderate for people under 60, perhaps severe for people over 60, but in a very specific group that we haven't protected. Our Chief Medical Officer of Health of Canada just announced yesterday that she believes that we've completely abandoned our seniors. I totally agree. With that, thank you so much for your time and for your activism, uh, if you can call it that, and for putting your voice out there. Dave, thank you very much. I appreciate much. it. Awesome. And yeah.